So for our first show, we have some very exciting things coming up. And make sure to stay tuned for an interview with the amazing and very colorful Howard Rheingold. In many ways, the granddaddy of virtual communities, who after decades in the space, has fantastic insights into the potential for virtual engagement. So also coming up, a brief tutorial on useful virtual tools and the top news this week in Things Virtual. So of course, this show needs participation. So please go to thevx.show, where you can both watch the live stream and also be part of the show. Then looking at virtual tools, we have virtual backgrounds. And as the whole world shifted to Zoom, many people soon discovered the virtual background feature, which allows you to take out whatever can be seen in the screen behind you and replace it with an attractive image or video. So others uh, followed suit, including WebEx, Skype, Microsoft Teams within the last month, though not yet Google Meet. But you don't need to depend on having your inbuilt uh, virtual backgrounds in your video call software. There are several options for software to control your background, whatever platform you're using, that are often better than the uh, built-in backgrounds. So each of these uses the output of your webcam, takes what's behind you, and adds a background. So then creates a virtual camera that Zoom or Go uh, Google Meet can use. So the, you know, the major ones which we have available are Xcam, uh, uh, Vcam, sorry, Vcam, uh, Chromacam, and the Minicam. So these are all ones which you can, um, you know, we don't have time to do a comprehensive review of uh, each of these, so I'll just say a few words on each of those. So uh, Vcam is part of the XSplit uh, series of uh, products, and it's uh, mainly aimed at gaming live streams, offering a quality virtual background feature, as well as choosing how much you can blur, blur your real background and the ability to use a transparent background, which can be used to build more complex sets. Uh, ManyCam offers the usual virtual background capabilities, but does far more, including adding multiple layers, so it's a more expensive product than the others. It runs on Mac as well as Windows, though note there have been some problems with virtual cams in Zoom with Mac as it has upgraded security over recent months. Vcam and Windows are, are Chromacam are Windows only. And Chromacam is a fairly simple and straightforward tool to replace or blur your background with an option to put PowerPoints as a background. For each of these, there are free versions, but with major limitations, so they're really just trials with costs between $3 a month and $8 a year for the full versions. So the, that brief introduction, I'll let you explore these tools further if you're interested in yourself. So. Speaking of virtual backgrounds and tools, some people may wonder how we do the Virtual Excellence Show uh, uh, with uh, just out of my desk. We will cover that in an upcoming episode of this uh, show, so come back for future episodes if you'd like to learn how to do what I'm doing today. So up next, we have to this week's virtual news. So the most interesting news this week is that Apple bought Next VR, a VR content production company that focuses on sports for a rumored price of $100 million. So Apple CEO Tim Cook has long said that augmented reality is the future, but at the moment Apple has not done anything or really barely spoken about virtual reality. What seems likely is that Apple's augmented reality glasses, which we can presumably call eyeglasses, will also have a virtual reality component. So you can either be immersed in a virtual world or see through that into the real world. So, so today, pretty much all real world events, conferences, and exhibitions have been canceled, with many of them being put online. And one of the more interesting ones to become virtual is the famous virtual uh, Chelsea Flower Show in London. And so this year has been presented as a virtual show, including tours by famous gardeners, such as Monty Don, tutorials, uh, exhibitions, and things from exhibitors. So it really has become a, uh, a different virtual show. So we are going to then move to discussion and Q&A. So if you go to the vx.show, uh, you will see that there is a chat show on the right using Facebook comments. So please enter your any comments, any questions for Howard or myself. And but now what we'd like to do is to switch to 
joining Howard on screen. So welcome, Howard. Hi. Uh, have you got uh, audio on? Yeah. Uh, fantastic. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, joining us on the show, Howard. Happy to do so. <laughs> so starting off, you've, I don't think uh, that many people know your background or the well, the well, which was the Seminole virtual community. So can you just, you know, just say a few words about what that, the well, what it was and your experience of that and how that kicked you off on your, your uh, journey? Uh, well, the well was uh, foremost, but not the only uh, com computer conferencing system, they call them uh, back then. It's like a fancy uh, computer BBS. It was started in 1985 by the, the same people who started the Whole Earth Catalog, Stuart Brand, together with Larry Brilliant, um, who you may be seeing as an epidemiologist uh, these days. And it started with the Whole Earth Network, and I think that had a lot to do with its success because it was a very eclectic group. Some people were interested in back to the land, and some people were, were interested in alternative energy or ecology, and some people were interested in technology. So it it became, I felt that it was a community when I, I started seeing people engaging in mutual aid. There was a, a parent whose son was diagnosed with leukemia, and, and we organized a support group. Of course, there are millions of people in medical support groups these days, but 1985, that was a new thing. So it actually, I wrote a, an article about it for the Whole Earth Review called Virtual Communities in 1987. And it took me five years to find a publisher who was willing to ad advance me on a book because uh, the publishers were saying in the late 1980s, early 1990s, that only electrical engineers would want to communicate with computer systems. So I did write a book. It was... Uh, called The Virtual Community. It's it's online uh, on my website, and you can also uh, buy the MIT Press um, edition of it. And uh, that was, what, 30 years ago, and I've uh, been involved with looking at the future of communication media since then. So fantastic. And so part of the, the journey as well, so I recall uh, that you had a community uh, brainstorms and yeah. I, that was a curated community so I remember you were asking send me an email why, asking why I should be admitted and uh, you kindly let me in so that, I, think, I recall that as maybe four or five thousand people all very much selected and some incredibly stimulating conversations from that so what what was well, that was 19, that, that started in 1988, uh, 1998, right. 98. and it's still going. If, if anybody's interested in joining, we're constantly welcoming new people. It's brainstormscommunity.org, and you can get in uh, information from there. But I had a, start, I had a startup called um, Electric Minds in 1996 and 1997. It combined what is now called user generated content with what's now called social media, both of them 10 years too early. Time Magazine named it one of the 10 best websites of the year in 1996, and we were out of business in 1997. And, uh, and we had a policy that anybody could, could create an account and anybody could post anything. And uh, we had up to 50,000 people on it. And by the time we were out of business, I was really tired of the the Nazis and the and the trolls and the, and the jerks. So I wanted to start a place where you could actually get thrown out for being a jerk, um, and that was the start of brainstorms. And I just invited a bunch of people, and it's it's still going. We had uh, oh, 20 or 30 people show up in San Francisco and in Memphis and in Amsterdam for uh, get-togethers. And there's a number of people from Australia in it, so people from all over the world. Uh, I recently wrote a, a piece on let, let's see if we can preserve and expand some social green space online because, you know, way back when the well was going, 1980s, there was Usenet had uh, probably a hundred different countries. There were yeah. tens of thousands of people participating. There's a, a lot of people think that social media started with Facebook yeah, um, and, and Facebook is, is trying to convince people that it's the internet. Um, 
It's what's called enclosure. And yes, you can socialize with your friends within the template that Facebook allows. But, you know, we have still have a lot of open source and free tools that people can use to create their own um, communities outside of the enclosure of Facebook. You know, there's simplest is you could just use WordPress and, and a, a comment threads or, or discuss with it. But there's forums like discourse, there's chat rooms, there's, yep. um, you know, all kinds of ways that you can communicate with your friends. And I'm urging people to, to do that just so that we'll, you know, we, we actually wouldn't have the web as we know it if it hadn't been for a lot of amateurs creating their own. Yeah, well, that's pieces. right. And so, you know, the, the well was seminal. And, and from that, so much as uh, a merge of contemporary, you know, culture of all kinds, including virtual culture and, uh, you know, social media, that was social media well before the day. And so now I think, you know, there's hopefully a bit of a pushing back against the, uh, as you say, the enclosure of Facebook. And I think that, you know, that tide is turning very slowly, but there's are other promising things coming up uh, around as well. Well, you know, I think it's really a, ma a matter of people creating spaces in, in which they don't tolerate uh, manipulation and intolerance as, as you find on, on other media. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I'm, there, a lot of trolls say, well, this is a free speech issue. Well, in the U.S., free speech has to do with the First Amendment to our Constitution. And, and that says Congress shall pass no law. Um, it doesn't mean that I can't toss you out of my bar and grill or my, my EBS if, yeah. if you're misbehaving. And, and I think that people really need to, to take that into account and, and hold people to you know, just uh, minimum standards of decency to each other. It doesn't mean don't have arguments. It means, uh, you know, don't, don't troll people and, and call them nasty names and, and, and brigade them. All the things we're seeing that happened online these days. So, so something else I wanted to, to raise, Howard, is that um, there's a very popular word these days, uh, teledildonics. I, I know quite a few people say it's their very favorite word. And uh, that is popularly attributed to Ted Nelson. But according to my research, it's, I think it comes from you. And I just want to hear a little bit about the origins of the word teledildonics. Well, um, Ted Nelson did come up with the word dildonics. Uh, but in 1990, I was writing a book on virtual reality and the idea that 30 or 40 years in the future, people might ha have uh, sexual uh, relations at a distance using machinery um, was a pretty far-fetched idea. And so that's where the uh, word teledildonics came from. Uh, virtual reality was pretty crude and cartoony and kind of made you sick in 1990, and it, it was assumed that, oh, in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, there will be sufficient computing power for it to not make you sick and not be cartoony. And, and in fact, it's, it's pretty photorealistic these days, and only a few people get, get sick on it. Um, but, you know, it's, it still hasn't uh, become the all-encompassing medium that people thought it it, it would be, and maybe it will someday. Maybe when it's just a simple pair of eyeglasses, maybe yeah. when Apple makes it, it'll, it'll happen. But so far, it, it, it isn't. You know, the teledildonics was just an example of trying to think of, well, this is what's happening today. What might be happening 10 or 20 or 30 years uh, from now? You know, just, just as you do. Yep, absolutely. And so, uh, as you may know, I've got a publication in the future of sex.net, which, which looks at all of that and we're, we're far more detail of what all that does. So you mentioned this word uh, earlier, mutual aid. And, um, you know, I think you've, you've written a piece recently, which looked at how the well and inspired by that and this idea of social capital. Now, I think that many, many people have written about social capital. But this seems a particularly pertinent time uh, in human history to be thinking about social capital and mutual aid. And so I'd just love to hear from looking at this virtual world perspective as to what you think uh, we could or should be doing in the world and in building social capital today. Well, you know, one, one of the things that really got me going on, on communicating through computers can lead to, to people forming communities was the way that the people who had not known each other from other contexts, who had been strangers before they 
conversed online, we're, we're doing things for each other in, in real life. Um, you know, s- sitting by the uh, side of somebody who is dying, um, driving people to uh, appointments for chemotherapy, the kind of things that you expect uh, a family or community to do. So I, I asked a friend, his name is Mark Smith, he's a sociologist, um, way back uh, in 1992 when I was writing the virtual community, why would people do that? And he said, social capital, knowledge capital, and communion. So I, I really didn't understand what the uh, literature about social capital was. Uh, so I studied a bit, and, and I, I taught it. Uh, I, when I taught about social media at, at Berkeley and Stanford, one of the important and practical things was about social capital, which, which can be simply defined as uh, people who do things uh, collectively uh, without uh, formal mechanisms like laws and contracts. You know, an, a, an old example of this that everybody knows is the, is the barn raising, where all the neighbors get together to, to uh, raise the barn. Or, you know, if you're a farmer and you break your leg and it's harvest time and, and your, your uh, neighbors uh, bring your crop, crop in, that's mutual aid. Social capital is sort of like the reservoir of social aid, uh, of... of uh, of mutual aid. And now, of course, um, well, in the US in particular, we're, we're seeing a failure of leadership at, at the top in regard to uh, reacting to the COVID-19 um, epidemic, pandemic. And, and so what we're seeing is a lot of people organizing in their neighborhood, their community, their municipality, their, their, their state. Uh, I, so I wrote a, a post uh, of this on, on my Patreon and I wrote about what social capital is. One, one dis- definition of what's required for social capital is networks of trust, which you can develop online, and norms of reciprocity. Somebody does, somebody else does something for the group, you do something for the group. Um, it's not what, what they call a quid pro quo. It's not like you ask me a favor um, and uh, then you owe me one. It's, well, you're a member of my group and you ask for a favor, I will, I will reciprocate in a diffuse manner to the group. Yeah, I, will, I, I will do a favor for you. And someday somebody I don't know will do a favor for me. So um, when I wrote this article, I thought I would just look up a few examples of uh, mutual aid that's happening around the epidemic and, and feeding people. Um, and I found that there's there were more than I could list. And if you begin looking at what people are doing online to organize activities to get each other food and, and to take care of the their health and their community, you'll see that there's real, a real explosion of it. And I think that that's one of the most important things that we can do together online. And we, I think, have lost track of a little of that, but I think now it's time to get back to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I think, you know, we, we humans are community animals, and uh, that's been torn away in some ways and supported by others. But I think at this juncture in humanity, it is critical and we have the tools and we have the knowledge, I think, you know, over the last decades with you and the communities you've been involved in, not least, to be able to support that. And I think that actually sort of goes on to a little bit to what you are doing now. And so you describe yourself as primarily an artist now and your work is supported significantly on Patreon. Yeah. So just like if you could love to see what some of your work. Well, I paint shoes. Wow. Here's a pair of, pair of painted shoes. I, um, I think that those could be appropriately described as psychedelic. I, yes. Uh, psychedelic means mind manifesting. Totally. Um, and also, so you'll see this is a, a wooden box, nice, nicely made wooden box. I made with maple and alder and walnut. Yeah. And inside it is a raspberry pie. Um, wow! And a screen, and it's just a it's a it's a, a an animated gift player. Nice. They just play psychedelic animated gifts, and if you you look inside it, you'll see that there's a Raspberry Pi and a screen. So I'm really interested in the technologies that are now available for artists and and craftspeople that that enable us to create interactive works that have lights and sounds and and that uh, you can gesture at. Uh, without really being a, an electrical engineer or or much of a programmer, and uh, 
It used to be that you could do this, but it was expensive and you needed expertise. Now we've got these things like Arduino and, and Raspberry Pi that enable people who want to make art or, or practical things to, to do it um, inexpensively. Absolutely. So, and just tell us about uh, Patreon and your Patreon. Well, you know, I got tired of Facebook. I, I got tired of contributing to their surveillance capitalism when I was sharing my stuff, the things I write, the art I make. Um, so I quit. And I like Patreon, uh, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, because it's really a, a, a way to, of getting away from the surveillance capitalism model. And instead of um, surveilling everything I do and then um, selling uh, my... I like the idea of having a public rather than an audience. People who not only do they believe in what I'm doing enough to pay me a dollar a month or something, but they can comment on what I do. They can, they can give me links to things that, that might interest me. They might join me in some kind of collective action. Um, so I don't think that the business model of the web is going to be overtaken by the Patreon model, but I think it, for creators, if you create podcasts or videos or you write books or you make cartoons or you make the kind of things that I make, it's a really interesting way to share your work and, and maybe make a little money on it. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I think it's particularly the community you've built over the years. It's a, it's a fantastic model for you. So we'll really only be able to touch the surface of the, uh, you know, the wealth of insights which you have to bring. And I'd, I'd love to, as we sort of progress the show, to maybe come back and dig into something specific, uh, particularly around some of the, that, that idea of social capital and, and how we can do that in some future episode. But anyway, so thank you so much, Howard, for your time and your insights. For everyone listening, please... Uh, Check out uh, Howard uh, Ryan Gold's uh, Patreon and see the wonderful art he has and uh, see if you can support him. So thank you so much, Howard. Have a uh, wonderful rest of your day. My pleasure. Take care. So we're now wrapping up. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to speak to Howard and uh, just pleased that we can announce the our guest to our next show, John Hagel. So John has been writing about and with deep insights into the connected world and what's possible from that for, well, so certainly for two and a half decades. I think his first book was around 1995. He's now the chairman, co-chairman of the Deloitte Center for the Edge, based in Silicon Valley, so sort of leading Deloitte's thought leadership initiatives. And one of the things which we're particularly keen to talk with John about next week is around the future of organizations and uh, virtual, how they can be enabled in virtualization. So his, John's mantra these days is around sustainable learning, and we will look around how that we can do that in a connected world. So now we'll just, um, just want to, there's pretty much a wrap now. So you know what the time is. Uh, so same week every time. I think we can promise that we'll have uh, less, uh, production issues uh, from now on. This is the first time, so not everything goes quite according to plan. But so thank you so much for being on the show. There's going to be plenty more of this. We will be exploring virtual everything, how to excel, uh, drawing on the most extraordinary people, the pioneers, the visionaries, the experts, and together trying to see how we can create a world of virtual excellence as we are connected. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day.